Shall we pray? Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we can be a part of your service and to, uh, to bring this message of both liberty and freedom, uh, because truly we are free from our sins only in you. And so we ask that you'll bless this service now as we further wait upon you and uh, bring uh, the message home to each and every heart. We pray it in Jesus' name. The title of this, of this little sermonette is Proclaim Liberty Throughout the Land. Now, you're well aware that this coming Tuesday is July 4th, and we will be celebrating our nation's 241st birthday. On July 4th, 1776, in the city of Brotherly Love, our founding fathers signed a document known as the Declaration of Independence. With that document, which formally declared our independence from England, a new nation was born, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal and endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. This nation, later to become known as the United States of America, was based on the ideals of freedom free to become what God intended us to be, which was a new and revolutionary idea to the rest of the world. So in a few days, we will begin again celebrating this precious gift of freedom. We have today because of the price that others paid on our behalf. You see, we must never forget that freedom isn't really free. but we should also remember that it is infinitely more valuable than life itself. Now, most Americans will associate the date 1776 with the birth of our nation, and rightly so. But what most Americans don't realize is that the document known as the Declaration of Independence, our, father, for our founding fathers not only declared their independence from Great Britain, they also just as strongly declared their dependence upon God Almighty. Yes. Amen. I earlier recalled how the actual document begins by reciting a part of it, that this nation is dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal and endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. But does that, anybody remember how it ends? Probably not, so I'm going to tell you. It ends with these words, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Now, the word reliance means a vital dependence on someone or something, doesn't it? And in this case, dependence hinged entirely and specifically upon God Almighty. Or you see, the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were not merely affixing their names to a document. They were staking their very lives on the faith in God's ability to watch over them and to see them through their struggle for freedom. Amen. You see, the, nation, the USA is a nation founded upon the notion that we must be free, free from tyranny and free to worship according to the dictates of our conscience. And furthermore, to be dependent upon God for our continued freedom of worship. The spirit of 76 was one of reverence and trust in God. The words in the title of this sermon, Proclaim Liberty Throughout the Land, was a message well known and oft recited during the revolutionary days, both before and after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Does anybody here know where that phrase, proclaim liberty throughout the land, originates from? Somebody said it back here. The Bible. Where can it be seen prominently today? Who said that? The Liberty Bell, yes. It is actually engraved in one of the most famous landmarks that resides not too far from where we sit today. After our founding fathers unanimously approved the Declaration of Independence on July 2nd, 1776, and it was signed on July 4th, the first public reading took place on July 8th, 
and it was celebrated by a band and the ringing of bells. And the very first bell they rang was in no other place but the belfry of Independence Hall, where they had approved the Declaration of Independence. That bell was rung to summon the people to come here, the reading of America's founding document. They rang and rang that bell so long and so loud that many believe the first crack formed in what we know today as the Liberty Bell. Does anybody know how the Liberty Bell got its name? The name actually comes from the scripture imprinted on the bell itself. From Leviticus 25.10 where it says, And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. That message given by God himself to the nation of Israel was in the context of Sabbath rest, including the sabbatical year and the year of Jubilee. And the concept was all about liberty and freedom, freedom for both the land to recover its production en energies in the seventh year and freedom to any impressed inhabitants of the land to recover what they may have lost in the 50th year. Yes, God is a God of liberty, of freedom, for you see, he created us as free moral agents with the ability and the freedom to choose him or not to choose him. In fact, God is as interested in our individual liberty and freedom as he is in our allegiance. When he sent his son, to uh, Jesus, to this earth as a babe, one of the hallmarks of his messiahship was liberty as prophesied by the Old Testament and recorded in Isaiah, chapter 61, verse 2, which states that Jesus, when he would come, would proclaim liberty to the captives. Friends, that's good news for you and me, isn't it? Amen. For that is, in essence, the good news of salvation. Jesus himself, in Luke 4, 18 and 19, quoted the first part of this prophecy, and he applied it directly to himself as the Messiah. So now fast forward down through history to the day in which we're living. Everyone here is aware that there is an ongoing discussion in America over whether or not this nation was really founded upon Christian principles. Atheists and agnostics across this land are reminding us of that fact over and over again, day in and day out. Unfortunately and inaccurately, that seems to be the prevalent thought of most Americans today. However, these people simply can't rewrite history, even though they'd like to try. And anybody who reads and understands history knows that we as a nation was shaped by our founding fathers from the Judeo-Christian ethic that is found throughout the Bible. Yes, we are a biblical nation from our very roots, and it is safe to say that the Christian faith was involved in practically every aspect of our nation's beginnings. Does anybody here know the real reason why Christopher Columbus came to the Americas in 1492? Probably not, so I'm going to tell you. It wasn't in search of a new trade route to India or the Orient or in search of gold, as many surmise. For we have his own words in 1504, 12 years after he made his maiden voyage, he wrote, I was led by the Holy Spirit to carry the message of the gospel to the undiscovered lands. Amen. Astonishing. History books won't tell you that. You are all familiar, of course, with the pilgrims who came here to Plymouth Rock on the Mayflower in 1620. Just as they landed, they joined together in what is called the Mayflower Compact, the words of which that compact go like this. Having undertaken for the glory of God and for the advancement of the Christian faith, do solemnly and mutually in the presence of God covenant and combine ourselves together in the name of God. Amen. Now fast forward again to the early summer of 1776. The Second Continental Congress met in Philadelphia in Independence Hall, and a resolution was adopted that read as follows. And I quote, Resolved that these united colonies are and of a right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, 
quote. So the die was cast, and on July 1, 1776, Congress reconvened, and the following day the same resolution was adopted. Late on the afternoon of July 4, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was officially adopted as church bells and the Liberty Bell rang out, proclaim liberty throughout the land. So many are wondering today how much longer we can depend on God's blessing and protection. For years, we've been telling God to get out of our schools, get out of our government, and in many cases, get out of our lives. But I'm here to tell you that the burden of the health of this nation does not rest upon who is in the White House, the State House, or the Courthouse, but on the people here and everywhere in the church house. Even though most Christians today are ignorant about the culture in which we are living, for many the church is being used as a fortress where we, where we retreat from the world. Jesus never told us to retreat. Instead, he told us to charge into the world and carry his good news. Amen? Jesus said, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Matthew 10, verse 16. Unfortunately, many Christians have misconstrued this advice and have become as mean as snakes and flighty as doves. But we must wake up, people. We must lift up our prayers, wise up, and be willing to stand up for what we believe in a culture that has become more wicked and perverse by the day. In that regard, I refer you to the Apostle Paul who wrote these words to the believers at Philippi. Become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life, Philippians 2, 15 and 16. Yes, our nation was started on Christian principles, but it is struggling in moral decay and darkness today. And Jesus has called us to be the light of the world. Our culture has gotten rotten. And Jesus has called us to be the salt of the earth. Can we make a pledge here today that we will reorder the priorities in our lives and start to live up to that billing? What do you say? Amen. Now, just like America, I'm going to ask Calissa to come up at this time. There's an African nation that received its independence from Great Britain 55 years ago. Did you know that? 59, 55 years ago this year. And that nation is Uganda on October 9, 1962. Received their independence. Same year my wife and I were married. Now, most of you already know that Calissa has been to Uganda, spent a month there, and she has a story to tell us right now for the next uh, few minutes about what she did there. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. All right. Sounds like I'm on. Okay. And can most people see for the most part? Okay, good. Got a nice atmosphere in here now. Okay, so for those of you that don't know, my name is Calissa, and I spent May 15th to June 15th in Jinja, Uganda, which is a city in the southeast, right along Lake Victoria and the Nile. It was really beautiful, and I stayed at the James Place. This is the sign right outside of our place. Plot 29, Kassinja Road is where I called home for the month. And it had an actually really pretty view of the lake. It was nice. Um, I need to not touch this. <laughs> um, and the reason it's called the James Place is because it's named after um, the verse in the Bible, James, 1, James chapter 1, verse 27. That reads, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So basically what they do, I know I've kind of explained this a couple times, but what they do is help single mothers in Uganda to maintain their families and keep them together by giving them business classes and English classes um, and teach them a trade. 
And so while the moms are doing that, they also have child care and preschool, which is what I mainly helped with. But the woman who put it all together is this lady. Her name is Tina Ware. And she went over to Uganda in, I want to say, 2007. And her goal was to adopt um, a Ugandan girl. She had fallen in love with her. She was in the process. And somewhere along the way, the process went south. And like happens in most adopt, not most, but a lot of adoptions, um, she wasn't able to complete it because of circumstances with the family and with the country. And using her background with her, um, really her husband marriage relationship and the situations that she'd been through in her life and also going through this with this orphan, um, she decided that the problem wasn't that there weren't enough orphanages, which is what she originally wanted to do in Uganda, was open an orphanage. Um, but, oh, I clicked a button. but she decided that instead of opening an orphanage, she would try and maintain those families so that there wouldn't be orphans in the first place. Because a lot of the problem is rooted in the, um, the idea that the moms either get pregnant too young or can't care for their children because they're either abandoned or widowed or stricken with AIDS and can't do it financially. So the James Place, the actual place where I stayed, was opened in 2013 and has been working ever since. When I was there, I saw one graduation of about five ladies from the business program, which was really cool because they were very proud of themselves. Um, but other than that, on a daily basis in, at the James Place, I worked with the children. Um, they are such a light. I love them so much. They, on a daily basis, the day starts at about 7.45 with child care, and child care lasts all day till about 5.15. But in those hours, the older kids from ages three to six have a preschool class. So I was in baby class with the three and four year olds and this is my class of 14 kids. Um, they're so sweet and we just sit in a room. It's only about two hours. Um, but Tina really emphasized the fact that the Ugandans be able to support themselves and do everything themselves so that one day they can go out on their own and make a difference without being in the organization. And so I worked alongside two full-time teachers and they did a fabulous job. So I was basically just extra hands. I would make crafts for them sometimes. I had a center. Um, here's a few more pictures. This is me with them and then they would work on things daily like um, reading, not fully when they're three, but learning, they need to learn a new letter each week. They will learn how to write with pencils, they learn how to shade, cut with scissors, a lot of fine motor things that really, they seem small, but they really build up whenever they're actually going into the public school at age seven and need to do that. We have had a few graduates from the preschool program in Jinja, or in, at James Place, and every single one of them is the top of their class in public school, which is such a blessing. Um, this is their classroom. It's pretty much just a little bit of chalkboard paint and some bright colors and Bible verses, um, but it works. It works for them. Um, these are two of the crafts that we made with them for the letter D and the letter G. Um, and they also, of course, had a math center and colors and shapes, that sort of thing. And then once they moved on from my class, they would go to what they call top class, where they actually do start to read and write on their own and do things that are actually really impressive for six-year-olds. So that's what I did for about two hours in the morning. And then throughout the rest of the day, I helped all the child care workers take care of every day from basically birth to age six. They have about 65 kids. Um, and a lot of awesome ladies to take care of all those running around kids all day. So I was an extra set of hands to help with that th throughout the rest of the day with feeding and bathing. These are, this is just talking about you guys because while I was there, I saw pretty much all of your donations be used in one way or another, which is really cool. Because a lot of times you donate money or you donate objects and you can't see them used. And I didn't get to take pictures of everything because sometimes it was just a glue stick or a pair of scissors. Um, but these are some of the uh, dress-up clothes that you donated, which the kids absolutely love. This is a Kenna wearing the um, 
armor of God. And um, the bride over here is um, Keshis, and the girl in the tutu is Kathy. And they just absolutely adored everything that you guys brought. The coloring books, the even the down to the duct tape, and just the little things that are just, they seem like simple utilities here, but they just absolutely love them. So whenever I wasn't in uh, preschool, let me get choked up. Um, this is a Kenna. He is just one of the favorite people, my favorite people I met there. He is so sweet. Um, every day for about 15 minutes, I would tutor two kids. Um, so right before they left to go home, I would do a kenna for 15 minutes, and then I alternated between two other little kiddos for 15 minutes as well. He was sick pretty much the whole time that I was there, and it turned out to just be a virus, but um, about halfway through my stay there, we found out he was being tested for sickle cell, which was really scary because he hates doctors, and who doesn't? I hate doctors. Um, and they found out that it wasn't sickle cell, so that was just such a blessing. And it honestly was just one of the best news to hear. Uh, so spending time with him and just being able to connect and kind of just love on him for a little bit each day was a highlight of every day. Um, okay, so the preschool is in session from Monday through Friday. But child care works every day of the week except for Sundays. Um, and on Saturdays, every day, we have sort of like a mini, well, actually, it's not mini. It's huge, VBS. Um, they don't call it VBS, though. They call it Kids Club. And this is when our child care kids are there, like a normal day, but they don't have preschool. So instead of preschool, they have Kids Club. And that's where they invite hundreds of kids from the little villages um, surrounding Jinja and the town and the city in Jinja to come in our gates and learn about Jesus, which is really cool because a large amount of the population in Jinja, as well as I think Uganda as a whole, is Muslim. So a lot of these kids come from Muslim households where they don't hear about Jesus, and so it's really cool for them to be able to be in this environment. But the very first hour is just straight up playing. They <laughs> go wild because um, at least from what I've experienced, I'm sure this isn't true with every kid, they don't oftentimes get the chance to be kids like this and play with equipment. So, like here, they're using the monkey bars, but we also had a slide and a bunch of swings and balls and jump ropes and a tree house, which was awesome. Um, so they just got to come and just be free and play. But the cool thing was that a lot of them came with their siblings on their back. They would carry them the whole way there, they would come and hang out. They would play with their sister on their back. and But they were so gracious about it. They loved caring for their little ones. So even the tiny babies were able to come and hang out with us for a few hours. And once the playing was done, it was circle time, which reminds me a lot of VBS, because this was just straight up singing, chanting, worshiping for probably 15 minutes. And it was just really cool, because all the kids got involved, and I didn't say this, but the average amount of kids that we had when I was there was about 400, which is pretty crazy, because um, that's a lot of kids running around the, the compound. The max I think they've ever had is like 650, um, but this is about 430-ish, um, and they just come and they sing, and some of the songs are in their native languages, Lugandan, so some of the songs are in Lugandan, but a lot of the songs are in English, which is good for them to learn, too. And it's just a, so fun to just praise with them and get silly and do motions like we do in VBS. Um, so that was the next 20 minutes. And then later they, as you can kind of see, the leaders, of course, as Tina wants, are all Ugandan women and staff members who run it, plan it, get everything going. Um, and right now, they, after they sing, they gather everybody together. They start out the day with prayer, and then they break them up into age groups. They probably had about five or six. And in those age groups, they learn a specific Bible lesson each week. So the one week, it was the Tower of Babel. One week, it was um, Abraham. 
and they just learn a Bible verse, and they learn about the power of God, and they really just, it's kind of like a class, but they're also really involved, and while they're in those small groups, we feed them a snack, um, whether that be just a little roll or a hard-boiled egg, and they always get a cup of water each week, um, just because a lot of them are pretty hungry. So while they're in the, those groups, they kind of just chill with their leader for a little bit and hang out and learn um, some. And uh, the very coolest thing that I think is every day at the, every Saturday at the end of Kids Club, the kids line up and each get what they call a sweetie, which is just a lollipop, with a little piece of paper taped to it that has a Bible verse on it. And if they bring that Bible verse back the next week, with a signature on it, they will get a prize, which is pretty darn motivating to these kids because they love getting prizes. <laughs> uh, a lot of times it's food or toothbrushes or school supplies. This week it was just fun beads, um, little clackers or little trinket toys. Um, but the signature on the Bible verse is by a person that they shared the verse with, um, which means that if we have 400 kids attending Kids Club, and I would say 98% of those kids bring those verses back the next week because they really want that prize, um, which that means that they're sharing that verse with at least one other person, whether that be a neighbor or a parent or, I don't even know, a kid from school, a teacher, which that adds up. That's like 800 people a week that are reading scripture. I just, that really blows my mind. So that's the whole line of them lined up to get their um, prize. And then this is um, a staff member and Tina helping to pass out the prizes from the one week. And then they gather back up, they pray, they review, um, they get a couple of the kids to raise their hand and participate and tell about what they learned that day. And then another one of my favorite things, I have a lot of favorite things. <laughs> We form the Tunnel of Love, which is what they call. So every single staff member and intern there, we line up. That's the gate right back there, the green thing. And we all clap, and we cheer for them as they leave, and we just tell them that we love you. Thank you for coming. Please come back. Um, just a little bit of encouragement and a little bit of extra love for them as they head on their way. Um, and then they all just walk back down the road and go home for the day. Um, but those three hours are just so cool to me each week. Um, I was only able to go to a few of them because they had a holiday, but that was a special thing that they did every week for a little bit of a VBS. And then when I wasn't during the regular weekday, Monday through Friday, when I had the chance, I was able to visit each of the artisan programs that the abandoned women are in. So the first day I went to jewelry making, and they had me string up paper beads. Everything, pretty much everything they make is from some renewable resource. So this is just strips of used paper rolled up into little beads and strung. And I was stringing them for varnishing. And while I was doing that, it was just really nice to get to know um, the, the ladies that I wasn't able to interact with on a daily basis that were just in the program from the community and kind of learn about their stories, tell them a little bit about America because they're really curious about that, um, and just fellowship with them for like two hours out of the day, which was fun. Plus, they teach me pretty cool things about making stuff, so that was fun. And then this is sewing. The sewing department makes a ton of things. That means uniforms for our preschoolers and bags and journals. Um, but the one thing, they just started using leather, so they were super excited about it, and so I had the job of cutting out the hearts <laughs> to make for little tags for the bags. And again, I just hung out with um, some of the leaders in that and the ladies. And this was the tough one. <laughs> I had taken sewing classes, and I have sewn before, but I was pretty terrible at this one. Um, it was just really hard. These carpets are made from strips of T-shirts, and um, not like not burlap sacks, but little paper plastic sacks that they weave the t-shirts through to make little shag carpets like you can see on the left. And those two ladies right there were the most patient women I have ever met because I know that they can do this in like 
a fourth of the time than I was doing it, and probably way better. But they, despite the language barrier, just really kept encouraging me and were telling me how good of a job I was doing. And were just so sweet, despite the fact that I know that I was not being much of a help. But it was just really cool to kind of learn what they were doing. Basically, I was just trying to backstitch through the little columns to keep the t-shirts in place. And it's just a lot of fabric to go through, so they were really, really helpful and just cool to hang out with for a few hours. And last but not least, my favorite. <laughs> I should not have a favorite, but I love pottery so much. And I think that the things that they make are just absolutely beautiful. This is one of the plates. It's not fired yet, so normally it'd be black. But that was one of the ones that I helped to varnish and smooth. Um, but hanging out with these ladies was my favorite thing. Sometimes I would even like sneak up there just to hang out with them for a little bit because even though my family was like thousands of miles away, these ladies were my family. From day one, they were just so sweet. Like I, I can't even explain the presence that you just feel when you're around them and just how loved you know you are just by being with them. Um, back there in the red, that's her name's Parvin. She turned 19 when I was there, and that was literally a, such a shock to me because she has a two-year-old son named Benja. So she started at the James Place as one of the mothers because she didn't have any way to support herself, any family really. But her spirit and her drive, she's now one of the master potters, and she teaches pottery to the other women. And she's just such an amazing person. I just... She makes me smile. She, you can't be around her without hearing a worship song or um, just some sort of encouragement. And every day she would just tell you my main goal is to take care of Benja and to glorify God. And she would just constantly tell me that without the Lord, she would ha have never been able to do the things that she's doing. So just being with her and seeing her drive. When I found out she was 19, I was like, what? Like, I'm two years older than you. I want to be like you when I grow up. Like... <laughs> She was just, she was amazing. And this is like Grace, sweet Grace. She was the quietest person in the whole James Place. Like, as weird as this is, like, African people are very loud sometimes. Like, and it's not a bad thing. It's just all their joy is just bubbling over in there in Uganda. And from what I could tell, even just walking down the street, they would just be very jubilant, which was really cool to see. But Grace just always had this peace about her, and you'd just be around her, and she would just kind of just hold you in her arm and just really quietly like, ask you about your day and just, it was really sweet. Um, so in this picture, what they're doing is the first step of pottery that I have never witnessed. Um, they're actually making their clay. So behind that red barn is a big pile of rocks and they'll take the rocks and what they're doing right there with those sticks is literally pounding the rocks to dust. Um, and then I would use that little sifter and sift it and they would pound it so fine that it felt like flour. It was just so thick, but also so small. Um, and then they would mix it with water and wedge it and make the actual clay, which was mind blowing because I've used clay all the time, but I've never thought about where it really came from <laughs> or how it was actually made. So to know that these ladies physically made these plates from literal rock and dust was pretty cool to me. Um, and then what I helped do was varnish. So we'd take the little tiny white rock um, that's smooth and just rub it on the clay and on the pe finished pieces for like an hour <laughs> until it was perfectly smooth. And then that right there is the kiln that they built for themselves, which is very cool because kilns have to be at a specific temperature to do what they're supposed to do. So it was pretty neat to see how they were able to build that. And these are the rest of the pottery ladies. I just love them. This is Betty down front, and then Grace right beside me, Teresa and Mary. And they were just everything to me when I was there. Um, and I miss them very dearly. Some more people that impacted my life were just the people that I could have even met in America. The one girl that, these are all the interns that stayed with me. For the first week, it was just me, first two weeks. It was just me and the girl in the gray on the very left. Her name is Kaylee, um, which, number one, she was a huge help because she flew in with me from Chicago and had been to James Place twice before. So she, I didn't feel like I was going in alone, which was such an answered prayer. Um, 
And then the rest of these girls came about two weeks later, and they had, were just speaking truth over me the whole time. Um, I was already in such a good community, but now all there is one guy, so he was separated from us. But all 14 of us girls were living in two rooms. <laughs> So we have really had to like get along, but you would think it would be difficult, but it was honestly so easy with these ladies because they were such encouragers and just women of God that it was just so easy because they made life and made you feel like a better person. So it was just, it was really, really, really uplifting to be surrounded by their energy for two weeks. Um, and just to speak life into what we were doing there and through our devotions and our time spent was always valuable. So I just had to stick them in there because I love them so much. Um, and that was pretty much all I did on a daily basis. I also got to go on some cool excursions and I met one of the coolest guides ever and I think that's what I'll leave you guys with today. Um, this is Wilson. And he was our safari guide for three days. We had a four-day weekend because it was a holiday. So we had four days off, and we were like, let's go do something with these four days. So Tina recommended him to us, which thank goodness she did because he is the greatest. I'm pretty sure he knows every inch of Uganda, inside and out, all the cool places, because he just was so wise. But he was also such a father to us. We had 10 girls go on that safari, so it would have been very easy for us to really not know how to do something, or um, I don't know. It, there just could have been some things to go wrong, but he was such, he was a guide for the safari, but he was also just a guide for life <laughs> because he just helped us along and um, was just a nice little father-uncle figure to us the whole time. And what you see behind us is the national park that we did the safari in. So we were on our way there and we were driving and we come to this cliff. You might not really be able to tell, but right there is like a little drop off. And just you could see the whole savanna just like spread out in front of you. And he stopped the car and he pulled over and he let us out to take pictures and all that jazz. And you could just see forever, forever. I could not see anything else and it was just so breathtaking. And we were getting ready back to get back in the car, and he turned to us, and he's like, all right, girls, it's going to be a better ride from here on out. He said, the road is going to be paved the rest of the way because Queen Elizabeth visited us and visited this national park a few years ago, and they paved the road for her to come in on. And that's why the park is named Queen Elizabeth Park. So I was like, wow, like, why didn't they pave the road for me? I feel like a queen sometimes. <laughs> and he... <laughs> He giggled, and he was like, yeah, you are, but he said, I don't think you'd want to be a real queen. He was like, they don't get to do all this cool stuff because they're so guarded, and they have such responsibility and all that stuff. And he turned, and he just said the most simple sentence, but it, like, really just hit me to the core because I was like, wow. He just said, you can't see one side of a coin and think it's the world. And I was like, wow, Wilson, like... Good job, that's true. Um, and even though that applies to the queen because she's kind of restricted to what she can do, it also applies to us as humans because it's really easy to go about life thinking that your way is the right way or the only way. And as much as you can think in your brain that that's not true because logically we know we all live different lives, but until you kind of experience and see how different it can actually be, it's kind of hard to even believe that. So when these things hit you like a ton of bricks, when he said that, I was like, wow, like you're really right. I've been seeing these 21 years, my side of the coin, and I've only gotten a glimpse of the other side. Like I've only ever been to two other countries and experienced a few other cultures. Um, but still, it's just so eye-opening to be able to say that you have seen the other side of a coin for some one person or for one community. Um, I may just have spent most of my time in Jinja, but I was able to really connect with a lot of different people when I was there. And that really made all the difference because when I was there, I wasn't necessarily, I wasn't building a house. I wasn't preaching, really. I wasn't, um, and sometimes I struggled with that, not being able to see something tangible that I was building. But the relationships that I formed and the people that I met and the people that touched me is 
what it was all about. And there was actually a book written by a girl who went to Jinja and lived right down the street from us. And she was 16. Her name is Katie Davis. And she wrote the book Kisses from Katie. I haven't read it, but apparently it's good. So if you guys want to read it, I'd recommend it, even though I haven't read it. She said, I have learned that I will not change the world. Jesus will do that. I can, however, change the world for one person. And if one person sees the love of Christ in me, it's worth every minute, which that just encapsulated my whole trip because the people that I met, like even just Wilson for those three days, was made all the difference. And being able to see their side of the coin and their experience through life just really blew my mind. And so I'm planning on going back next year <laughs> to see them all again because I missed them already. It's been two weeks. Um, <laughs> But I just really, I cannot thank you guys enough. Because without your support and without all of the donations and the assistance and the prayer, it really would have been quite a different experience. So I'm very, very eternally thankful for the blessings that you guys have put into my life and just all that you've invested in my journey. Um, and I'm just so thankful for everything that I was able to experience because of you guys. So if any of you are questioning whether you want to do something like this, I say do it. <laughs> Um, all you really have to do is take the first step, and then clearly the church will step in and help with a lot of it, and the Lord, and so I just thank you. Yeah, thanks. But she had a lot of fun and enjoyed herself the whole time. I did. And uh, I'm just so glad that you met somebody named Wilson and he wasn't a soccer ball. <laughs> I know, or my pet ferret. That's my ferret's name, which is kind of weird, but yeah.